simcha, celebration, simcha, simcha, celebration of life. Hi from me, Jared Epstein, and welcome to another episode of Simcha, a celebration of life. Lockdown lethargy is kicking in, but we're here to help keep you entertained. The Klagstorp Jewish community was once made up of roughly 1,000 people. Today, it has unfortunately dwindled to a handful of souls. Michael Wax, the last remaining Jewish lawyer in the town, was the last chairman of the shul. We met Michael and his wife Marlene, also head of WISO and the Union of Jewish Women in Klagstorp, and they spoke about their experiences in Jewish life in the mining town. I was born in Rochester um, and lived there until I matriculated. My father was an attorney in Rochester. He was very involved in the shul. He was uh, chairman on many occasions. When I had my bar mitzvah, we had no rabbi in town. So an old Mr. Sandler said he would teach me. And Mr. Sandler had a second-hand furniture shop. So I used to go there in the afternoon, sit at the shop, open the book, start singing. He'd say, sing. And I'd start, Baruch Hu, he'd say, stop, a customer. And he'd jump up and he'd go and try and sell a second-hand bed or a table, and then he'd come back, he'd say, carry on. So that's how I learned my bar mitzvah. After I matriculated, I went into the army and ended up in Walfus Bay. When I came back after my nine-man service, I started doing law part-time at WITS and I started my articles at the same time. I was articled at the NACE rates. When I finished my diploma in law, uh, I, I had the right to appear in court and my father was acting for a Jewish attorney friend of his in Clarkstall who needed somebody to do his court work. So I ceded my articles. He said I'd only probably be here two years, three years, and that was in 1966. <laughs> nearly 54 years ago. I got married in March 67, and we set up home in Clarkstown. At first, to be honest with you, I was very, very unhappy. Every time I phoned my family in Johannesburg, I cried and cried and cried. Um, but as soon as I had my first baby, I settled down and I must say, bringing up my children in Clarkstorp has been wonderful. At that time, there were four Jewish attorneys practicing. And I joined Julius Rudolph, and I stayed with him for 13 years, and then I branched out with somebody else, and, that, and he eventually left Clarkstorp. I can say, um, in the years I've been here, I've been to the appellate division twice. Once in a criminal matter, it was a riot on the mines in the early 80s, and a number of uh, people were killed. And at the end of the appeal, the number one accused who was sentenced to death was convicted of culpable homicide. They had to release him immediately because he'd been in jail for so long. And of the others, they were also acquitted. The other matter was a civil matter. What happened here was the result of gross negligence. There was a tragedy on Val Reef's mine where the lift fell to the bottom and 120 miners were killed. So I went to the appeal court twice and I won twice, so I'm never going back again. 
One of the most interesting people that I had come into my office, I heard people in the reception and I went out and there were three gentlemen. So the one fellow jumped up and he said, I'm Cyril Ramaphosa, the Secretary General of the National Union of Mine Workers. I said, yeah. He says, I believe there's a little building over the road that belongs to you and your partner. I'm looking for officers because we need to get off the mine. Are they available? So I said, sure, come inside, would you like to? And they hired the premises from that day until quite recently. And, and it was through him that we got the work on the mines and all the public violence. Uh, when I came to Clarkstorp, there was a very big Jewish community. At that time, I was involved with Round Table. And I've been involved in Rotary since 1988. I think I was chairman in, or president in about 2010, somewhere around there. One of our pet projects is at the Tsepong Hospital in Jubaton is we have a rape crisis clinic. And then we have, uh, at Christmas time, we do f uh, gifts for all the people in the old age homes. My wife could tell you there used to be the Union of Jewish Women and there was, Wietso was still here. Wietso is a women's Zionist organization. Um, when I first came to Clarkstorp, it was very, very strong uh, because we were like 300 families. There was a very strong committee and, and the Union of Jewish Women who um, reached out to the community. Every Christmas we go to Techford, which is um, a place for disabled people, and we give them a Christmas lunch and there's a house called Hesa Fass. We go there, help them out, and wherever we can in the community, we help out. The difference um, to living in a big city in Johannesburg, and I can hear it when I speak to friends in Johannesburg, um, we are aware of so many things and we do things together, whereas some of the friends in Joburg can be quite lonely unless you really make the effort. Here, everybody is included. Somebody visited here and said it's amazing how the Jews in the small towns are all for each other. You know, everybody, we, we celebrate, we mourn together. Unfortunately, I think what happened in all the small towns, when the children finish school, they go to Johannesburg, Cape Town, to Varsity, and they don't come back. You know, in my own family, I've got three children, two are in Sydney and one is in London. They all graduated and left eventually. For the children, I think they had a wonderful time and they all flocked to come back to Clarkstalk. They, they loved to come back. I mean, even uh, last year, my son came with all his family and, and they just couldn't believe it. I said, oh, it's going to be so boring after London for you here. They loved it. They absolutely loved it. Mazel tov on your new office. I'm delighted to be here and to help you put on a mezuzah. Please say the bracha after me. Baruch. Baruch. Ata. Ata. Adonai. Adonai. Eloheinu. Eloheinu. Melech. Melech. Olam. Asher. Asher. Kiddishanu. Kiddishanu. B'mitzvotah. B'mitzvotah. B'tzivanu. B'tzivanu. Likboa. Likboa. Mezuzah. Mezuzah. Please push it onto the door frame. Mazel tov, mazel tov. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Radio personality John Burks was born Jonathan Berkowitz in Klerkstorp. 
He left the town while still a teenager and shared his memories of growing up as a Jew in the mining town and how a boyki from Klagstorp did it big in Johannesburg. Wonderful, wonderful, it's a wonderful weekend. I came from a, a fairly poor family, if I may say. My late father was a scrap dealer and battled, and he was a wonderful man. He, he just believed in one word called honesty. Everything had to be honest. And even if I plugged down at six or seven, he would say, just be honest and try harder, but would never ever point a finger and say, you stupid, or you an idiot, or whatever. He was just a, a grand old fella. I, I was very young when he passed away. He died in 1956, just, just after my bar mitzvah. Yeah, a long time back. And uh, my mum was still alive. My Yiddish mama. I love her more than ever now, my Yiddish mama. I long to kiss her wrinkled brow. I long to hold her in my arms. <laughs> As in years gone by. She was, um, she was a wonderful lady. She was uh, very involved with Witzo. Um, she was a very caring person, a wonderful, wonderful lady. Old and gray, but lived to be 105. When school, uh, Lord Milner, that was the Milner Primary School, and then the new school, Milner High School. I wasn't the only Jewish kid at school. There were lots of Jewish kids in school. In the afternoon, we'd go to Cheda with uh, Rabbi Kamionsky, and then we had a teacher called Mr. Schatz. But those were the days, you know, when we created our own activity, our own recreation, playing the games that kids played in those days. It was a lovely mix between where we lived and an Afrikaans community who, who I, I, I was never called a, I think once one little guy said, yes, uh, oh, you aiki. And I told my late father and my late father got very annoyed, but he didn't do anything. But what I'm saying is there was a nice harmony, a, a really good friendship and relationship between the Jewish community who lived in that little block but we lived in a little plot dog hazy. With a basky boom da fur, with a peach tree in the front. My late father was very keen on cricket, and we had something very special called a wireless. And we'd sit glued, the two of us. Five men saving the one, two up for the catch. Calling comes in. Bowls outside the off stump. There it is, four runs, wide it covers left hand. And the commentators, the way they described Edgbaston, Lords, and the Oval, the cricket grounds in England, and the beauty of it all, and the wonder of the game called cricket, which fascinated me no end, especially the spoken word that painted the pictures so beautifully. And that's when I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be on radio. And by the Radio 5 Top 20 chime, the time is exactly 9 o'clock. I'm jockeying them in on behalf of your regular jockey man, Johnny J, is away on a well-deserved holiday. I met up with someone at the SABC, Colin Duplessis, who spoke terribly beautifully, you know, and he was on the English program, the A service. And I said, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Lupici, I'm so wanting to be a radio announcer. He said, well, gosh, you don't sound like one. You've got a terrible accent. What, what are you looking for? So I, I said, no, I was wondering if by chance I, I just couldn't come and have a couple of lessons. So he said, well, I wouldn't give you much of a chance, but if you're so keen and you're so passionate about it, okay come along to the English service one day a week, which I did. And uh, that's how I got into radio, through the wonder of cricket. Luckles, luckles is all that I can say. And lucka, lucka, lucks, hackers play, hackers and hay. Because of Clarkstorp, I also developed a, a little phrase, boiki. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cute. A boiki's a little boy. Uh, he says, oh, look a boiki. Shemzach a little bit. 
Yes, but uh, listen, he comes from a lovely family. He's a boyke. He's a boyke. The community were, were Russian Jews that came from Lithuania, from Latvia, from all parts of the world to seek their fortunes in Clarksdorf. And they retained their Russian Jewish accent, which was fascinating for me. Spoke like, you know, from Russia, down the butcher, made the most beautiful steak, with burabos, with soaps, with everything, with built on. The Jewish people were opportunists when I think back, and Klokstorp didn't represent the opportunity that it did of years gone by, and the bigger cities did, and overseas too. Hence, you've had this great movement. The Hebrew congregation was a very large one, a very loyal, very united one, a very good one. And I'm sure it still is with the remaining people in Klokstorp. Sad to say, not many are still in Clarkstall, but they're still there. Very often that's what talk radio is all about. It's positive, it's negative. It depends what the subject is. It depends what your view is. This morning your view was positive. Oh, uh, Clarkstall's been wonderful in terms of uh, recognizing uh, me. Uh, they named the street after me. Wow, I, I just couldn't believe that. I know it was a little lane, but apparently it's a street and it's called John Burke's Street. No, no one's got something busy with my wife. Don't laugh, eh? You're Torben just... Mitchell? Yes. Torben, this is John Burks. You, you bugger. Burks, you little bugger. Nami and your known folks and are from a Johannesburg-based family of seven siblings. The brothers come from a musical family and share their thoughts on growing up with music at home and their ongoing connection with music and plans for the future. I don't think we were naturally a musical family, but my father decided, you know, he's going to buy instruments and we, because we loved the music, but it was more of a conscious effort to become a musical family. And in my family, I'm one of the older part of the family. And I think for my younger brothers, as like Yinon, the family was musical by the time he arrived. But in, in the beginning, it was a start of becoming a musical family. My first memories of music, I'd say mostly came around when I must have been about four or five because we were a very musical family and we were very connected to Shlomo Kollerbach, there was always a lot of music being played in the house. Um, and my father used to play guitar, I remember he had a few Dylan songs and stuff that really had a big impact. And we'd also like, connect as a family by playing music. <laughs> I love playing music. Music is what kind of, it frees me. It is the thing that makes me connect to the world. It's a form of communication. It's where I feel most comfortable. And for me, that is why I'm dedicated to it. And I love it. And it's something which has given me life. I see music as a, an expression of spirituality. It's not that the songs come out of you. It's that God actually showers down songs from heaven every day. And sometimes you manage to catch a song. When I was younger, I wrote a song called Yehi Shalom. It's really an expression of, please God, there'll be peace in the world. It was late at night and I happened to be playing a few chords and the song came to me and it really struck a chord. I'm in the process of busy recording an album and working on an album. Um, it's basically an album of six songs that um, all are based on a very similar theme. The theme is based on the denial of death. Oh yeah, mama, yeah, yeah. It basically deals with the big questions in life which I resonate with at a very deep level and I try to bring that into song. There is one song that I wrote lately over this holiday, which was actually a bit more of a collective effort over a period of time with a bunch of people. And 
It's very deep for me because it basically follows the inward journey of the soul. The first is the heaven state goes through a realistic state that is neither heaven nor earth and then there's kind of like a judgment state and each as the song goes through it, the emotions change with it. While I've been working on the album, the big part that I actually wanted to incorporate is that I fundamentally wanted to connect with all the people that understood me or knew me or that I connected with musically with them. And I found that there's a great resource of great musicians and great people within our community which have just give an amazing um, energy and an amazing style. And I think by incorporating the people that you grow up with and the people that you know closest to create something has a much more powerful effect than going out and looking for some kind of professionalism which is idealistic and doesn't actually translate into a beautiful product. And if you've got a burning heart, let it burn till the end from the very start. Playing with my brother is an amazing experience. I mean, from the earliest memories, the first most natural way to actually start playing music was always with my brother. It's amazing. It's what comes most naturally. I've always enjoyed playing music with my brothers. It's a lot easier to play with people you are genetically connected to. Like with other musicians, you would have to practice a lot more. But when you play with your siblings, it generally comes more naturally. And that really shows when you play with your brother. Music is it's part of my life. So at the end of the day, the way I unwind is I pick up my guitar and I play guitar. If I'm feeling a bit low, it could change my mood drastically. Out of reach, there's the soul. Dancing on the beach. What I hope to achieve in my music is to envelop myself within a moment of song in music and I think also to connect. It's one of the ways that I communicate with the world. That brings us to the end of this week's episode of Semcha, a celebration of life. As always, we'd love to hear from you. So please, send us a Facebook message at Spirit Sister Productions. From me, Jared Epstein, and the Simcha team, remember, the longer one carries a problem, the heavier it gets. <laughs>